بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على شرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى لبيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين الذين ذهب الله عنهم وغجسه وطهرهم تطهيرا ما بعد قال الله الحكيم في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولقد كتبنا في الزبور من بعد الذكر أن الأرض يريثها عبادي الصالحون صدق الله العلي العظيم A series of discussions have gone into its eighth night. Remember one thing. Any action, any step, any good word, anything which is done for the sake of Sayyid al-Shuhada, understanding who Sayyid al-Shuhada is, the reward is more than you can ever imagine. As these nights have gone by, you would have noticed inside of you that there is a change, that there is a softness, and that there is a movement your faith would have increased by now and your heart would have been softened by now. These are just some of the very few miracles which take place because of Sayyid al-Shahada. So therefore, any action, even a step that's taken, Sayyid al-Shahada doesn't hold a debt on his shoulders. For whatever you do, if you truly understand who you're doing it, for in fact, let me take those words back. Even if you have a minor understanding of who this son of Zahra is, it's sufficient for you that this world and the hereafter is yours. You know they say, Kamil Ziyarat. Every step that's taken in the way of Sayyid al-Shuhada. The reward is 1,000 Hajj, 1,000 Umrah. Now this is not me who's saying it. This is your Prophet who's speaking to Umar Salama. There's another tradition that says he's speaking to Aisha, where he's saying every step that's taken, Hajj, which is Maqbul, which is with me, Umrah, 1,000, 1,000. Question is asked, and you've heard this before, but I want to explain it again now. You know why? Because as these nights go on, your ma'rifah potentially increases. The very same hadith which we recite on the first of Muharram, by the eighth or ninth, you have a different understanding of it. If only you've worked on your heart. So now look at this. Story is in front of you. The example has been given by many ulama. A king goes hunting. And as he goes hunting, for three days he's lost. For three days, no food, no water. Eventually, he comes to a cottage. He sees somebody living in this forest. And over there, when he knocks on the door, a woman comes out. All she has in the world is one sheep. So what does she do? She gives the king milk from the sheep. And then she slaughters the sheep. And she gives the sheep to them to eat. So the king says to all of his courtiers, What should I give her? So somebody says, You should return her sheep back. Somebody else says you should give her 10 sheep. Somebody says 100 sheep. He replied, he says, wrong. Even if I give her half of my kingdom, she saved me and she saved you. In this way, Allah's deen was saved by Hussein ibn Ali. Anyone who takes a step in the way of Sayyid al-Shuhada, the ziyarah is accepted, the dua is accepted, and everything else is accepted. But at the same time, 1,000 hajj, 1,000 umrah. Today you've walked or you've driven to come here. And as per 
the rules and regulations of this country that we live in. We've kept under capacity to make sure that we're strict in these rules and regulations. So we have, as usual, our two elders who are here. But we also have somebody who's come six hours to be here from our neighboring country. And though his dua will be accepted today, we also ask him to pray for us, for anybody who comes in such a distance is accepted. Remember, when we go to Karbala for the Zawar of Hussein, for the Azadar of Hussein, Ahle Iraq, look at their hospitality. When somebody comes to our country, we also, and they come for Hussein, similar hospitality women to show. Our acceptance of our dua is showing hospitality for those people who are the guests of Hussein. And their acceptance is for every step that they take for the sake of Imam Hussein. And this is something if we can learn now, inshallah, when the doors open for Arbain and when you will go there, truly then you'll understand what goes in the heart of ahl Iraq when a six-year-old boy comes to you and says to you for the sake of Hussein, take this. You know, I've mentioned this before, but I remember many years ago when we were walking from Najaf to Karbala. It was a time when Daesh were at its peak and there was a threat that any of us could have been attacked. And from all over the world, people were coming. And at that stage, loads of people came. Why? Because know something in the history of Shias and whenever Imam Hussein's shrine is in stake, you find the most Shia come for the sake of Imam Hussein. So at that moment, we're walking and there's children with me. Someone from Dubai is there. Someone from East Africa is there. Somebody from America is there. We've got people from Canada there, from people from the United Kingdom over there, people from France over there. And as we're walking, a small boy comes. And we remember when the small boy came, he didn't have any shoes on. And when he came, he all he had was handkerchiefs, what we call tissue. In America, they call handkerchiefs. Brought it forward. And he came and he said something. He said, look, my mother and father were killed by Daesh. Now imagine small year old boy, small boy. He says, I don't have anything to give you. I wish I had something, but I have no money. All I have are these tissues. If you take one, at least on the day of judgment, I can say to Fatima to Zahra, I did something as well. Now that type of Iman, that type of belief, if we find it in a six-year-old boy, today we don't have that. Of course we do. We just have to uncover that. Whether or not we took it or not is another matter. Because in Sharia, as you know, child as yatim, it could have been his mal, it could be otherwise there's Sharia issues when it comes to taking something from a child, etc. But anyhow, it's the principle of what it is. The principle of the fact that here's a child whose consciousness is elevated. This is what Imam Hussain teaches us. Teaches us that level of humanity that unfortunately we've lost. And we have to develop that as well. We have to enshrine that as well as these nights are going. There was a maqsad, there was a method of Imam Hussain. Look, let's go back and see. Every Imam system has been quite unique. The only two Imams that we have who raised a sword were Amir al muminin and Imam Hassan. The reason why they raised it was because they were caliphs of an empire that required to be protected. Otherwise, Amir al muminin his haq was taken for 25 years, he remained quiet. He didn't take a sword. He didn't fight. But those three battles he fights is because of the peace of the community that they were attacking, he was defending. Look, we're not saying we're pacifists, that somebody comes and kills you when you stand there allowing somebody to kill you. According to every charter, you have the right to proportionally defend yourself. But none of the other Imams, you notice, lifted up a sword. Why? Because they weren't in the position to keep the peace of a country. The only person who defends himself is Sayyid al-Shuhada. If somebody was to ask you the question, was Hussein going to fight? Actually, he wasn't. His purpose was never to fight. Whenever somebody wants to make an excuse, they say, well, you know, you should, you should sign a peace contract like Imam Hassan did. Or if they want to justify their own means, we should fight like Hussein. Actually, say the Shuhada didn't fight. 
He wasn't out there to fight. His movement against oppression wasn't in a movement to fight. In fact, what Sayyid al-Shuhda was teaching us was the first stage of Tawheed, which is Tabarra. He did Tabarra on Yazid. He says, look, we're not here to fight, but I'm not going to give allegiance to Yazid. He taught with his character. It wasn't the fact that he came forward with a sword. Had that been the case, Medina was the ample place to take control. As you know, our ulama have said, when three people are together, nobody can defeat them. Who are they? Muslim bin Aqil, Abu al-Fadl abbas Muhammad al -Nafir. If those three brothers with Sayyid al-Shuhada came out close to Baqi, then you would have seen that no one could have come and won. What does Imam Hussein do? In the principle of the fact that he didn't want to fight, he says to one, you stay in Medina, you go to Kufa, you come to me, come with me. Purpose of that, Hussein is saying he didn't want to fight. And what is the biggest delil that he didn't want to fight? He took his children with him. And by taking his children, he showed the world their oppressors. If someone can turn around today and say that we accidentally killed a child, then tell me, you accidentally killed Qasim? You accidentally killed Ali Yasser? You accidentally killed Aun and Muhammad? And then you accidentally cut their heads? And you accidentally raised them on a spear? And if that's all accidental, then let me ask you a question then. What about those small girls? You accidentally beat them? You accidentally scarred them? They accidentally died? Tell me. For those people who say that it was a war between two princes, tell me, where's the truth in that? How can you accidentally exterminate the entire progeny of Fatima and then say that Yazid is correct? Your Islam and our Islam is completely different. You cannot do that. Look at the methodology. Every single Imam's way was the way of the heart. Why does Imam Hussein go to Karbala for? What is the actual purpose of him going? His purpose is to change hearts. He knew that he had to change hearts. You cannot change somebody by force. You cannot change somebody by the sword. Even when it comes to marriage and otherwise, when you convert for somebody, when you do something for somebody, they'll be the very same person to take you out of the deen as well. Many a time we've seen this. This is why do not force somebody to convert. Do not force somebody to do something. Do not force somebody to wear a particular clothing. Do not force anybody to do something. The reason being is this. If their heart doesn't appreciate it, what happens is that and eventually they will go out of the deen as well. Their traditions, if you force somebody or somebody does hijab for somebody else, that other person will be the person who will push this person away from hijab or away from Islam. What is Imam Hussein doing? Had he forced and had he won? Who've done this before? Zubairis did that. Where are they today? Umaris did that. Where are they today? Abbasis raised in the name of Imam Hussein. Where are the Abbasis today? They were even more tyrannical. People came forward in the name of Imam Hussein. They used the name of Imam Hussein. They fought in the name of Imam Hussein. And people fought with them. Question is this though. Where are they today? What is the method of Imam Hussein? The method of Imam Hussein is the method of Imam Zain al Abidin and the method of Imam Muhammad al Baqir and the method of Imam Ja'far al Sadiq and the method of Imam Musa al Khadim. Alayhi wasalam. Method of each one of them. What is that method? You begin by purifying people's hearts. You begin by capturing people's hearts. You create a revolution to revolve. Revolve what? Revolve people's heart. In Qalab. To what? Qalaba what? Where does it go back to? Qalab. You change the heart of the people, everything else takes form of itself. What is the method of the 12th Imam? What? He comes forward and he gives da'wah to people, introduces people, brings people in the way that the Prophet did. What is the Prophet's methodology? Through Rahmah, through mercy. Through what are the methods of the prophets? What did Nabi Isa do? Washed the feet of people, washed the hands of people, looked after those people who were oppressed. What did the prophet do? The first thing in Mecca he does is he takes care of those people who are oppressed. Today we have it the other way around. We try and attract those people who are rich to come. 
If you want to make a difference, you want to grab people who are rich, you want to grab somebody who you think is a mover and shaker, that's never been the methodology of prophets. They do it the other way around. They take the most impoverished and nurture them and they bring them to the top. Look in Karbala and see. Half of those people who are there, they weren't well-to-do people. They were those people who say you the shuhada brought forward and said, they may not think you're something, but I think you're something. My Allah thinks you're something. And until the day of judgment, when people come and do my ziyarah, they're going to be doing your ziyarah as well. Understand this philosophy. Go to those people who are here and bring them up here. Why? Because those people who are oppressed, their hearts are already broken. And Allah comes to people whose hearts are broken. Musa says, Nabi Musa says, Allah, my heart is broken. Allah replies, I'm for the brokenhearted. What is Sayyid al Shuhada? Nur. Nur of Allah. So when a heart is broken, the Nur of Wilaya goes into that heart faster. Why have we been told? Why do our elders, our ulama, have now said, when you're living abroad, and in fact, even if you're living, in an Islamic country, help people, help those people who are impoverished, nurture those orphans, give food to those people in the town that you live in. Look, we're going through a period of austerity. Half of our countries in the West are going through a recession now. There are many people on the streets, you've seen it. What is our responsibility? In the name of Hussein, who revived Allah's deen, Remember, Allah's giving you a formula. The one who can revive the deen of Allah can revive the deen of Allah now as well. In the name of Imam Hussein, make a step, take a step, go forward, feed people. If you live in London, feed people. If you live in Birmingham, Manchester, Edinburgh, Glasgow, Maryland, Virginia, Washington, Chicago, Toronto, and for all of those other people who have messaged from all over the world. Orlando, LA, Sydney, Dubai, Mumbai, Karachi. And if I've missed any other name who have mentioned or have texted me in the last couple of days, I apologize. But wherever you are in the world, take this message of Imam Hussein. What did Imam Hussein do? Raise those people who are impoverished. Go out in the name of Imam Hussein. Even if you can give one single date with the right intention, you see how Hussein takes over. We've been told you just give him one of our sayings. We do the rest. You don't need to give him the whole Quran. Nobody reads it. So when somebody knocks on your door and gives you an entire Bible with literature, you're not going to read it as too much. But if they were to give you a small slip, you'd read it. That's all you need to do. We're not evangelical, we're not here to convert anybody. All we want to do is show you the beauty of who Hussein ibn Ali is. That's what we want to do. And that's it. And the world appeals and they come to him. So look, the entire system of the Imams have just been that. None of the Imams, look, we're not living in worse times than the fourth Imam was. We're not living in worse times than the fifth Imam was. You're not being exterminated. Your children are not being killed. From the blood of Hassani Sayyids, Baghdad was created. The Qudama said it's makruh to live in Baghdad. Why? In the time of the Abbasis, the walls, they were plastered, Hassani Sayyids were. An extermination process took place. Aulad al-Zahra were killed wherever you found them. Why do you think Imam al-Radha in four years say, says to the Sa'ada, leave, go, go as far as you can. Why do you think they're from the tips of Spain all the way down to Indonesia? Because they ran away from oppression. They went wherever in the world they could do because they were being killed. This is why they're everywhere. The most Sayyids today, Indonesia. As far as Indonesia, there's a mosque in Burma. Muhammad Hanafiya Mosque. Those inhabitants, some of them over there, say Muhammad Hanif is buried there. Of course, that's not the case, according to our history. However, it's fine. When you make something Sha'ir al Hussein or Sha'ir al Allah, it's respect there. Today, say the Zainab has two graves one in Damascus, one in Cairo. 
some of our ulama say one is stronger, the other say the other is stronger. Right? And both of them are very strong. Ayatollah Bahjit says Cairo is the asl. Ayatollah Tabrizi would say Damascus is the asl. Say the Zainab over there. Regardless of what it is, your hajjah fulfills there, your hajjah fulfills there. Niyyah. It's the heart. Ahlul Bayt and the Noor of the Ahlul Bayt are not restricted to one place. Try say Ya Abbas now and you see. It's not restricted to one place. When you go and your parents teach you to go under that alam, whether you're in Karbala or you're in Winnipeg, the power of that alam is the power of the alam. So look, look at our Imams in the most period of time where there was the most oppression. They had a four-pronged methodology. I can't speak any more open than this. What I'm saying, analyze it, write it down, go home, think on it. Your entire philosophy of survival of the last 1400 years is what I'm about to say. And as many things, it will take much longer if we were to expand and talk about it. But within the time frame we have, I'm going to mention it to you and I'm going to move on. For those who grab it, grab it. For those who don't, you don't. What did Imam Zain al-Abideen do? You know the first thing he did? He developed networks. Networks, private networks. All over the Islamic world. Where he could teach people three things. Ilm, Ma'rifah. Now what's Ilm? Ilm is what you have it. I don't need to explain it. Ilm of the deen and ilm of the dunya. Ma'rifa. Ma'rifa has to do with the spiritual travel. Torture spiritual travel. Torture spiritual practice. But at the same time, pragmatically, he made sure that the community was firm. And at the same time as well, he made sure of another thing. And that was that this community wasn't going to be targeted after Karbala. Fifth Imam, the same thing. Sixth Imam, the same thing. On the point of the ninth Imam, Ghaybatir, Suhra essentially begins, where the Imam, automatically three of our Imams, essentially go into occultation. And they devolve into their networks. Why do you think that a government or a group like the Fatimids was successful? Because even before secret societies were founded, they had their own secret societies. The entire Templar model was based upon the Fatimis when they most probably bumped into them in either Quds or in North Africa. But look, I don't want to go deeper than that. The only thing here is I will say, how did you identify Shia? Because they used to wear a ring on a particular finger, which was a turquoise. Had a particular handshake, had a particular stuff. Survival. Why do you think in the time of Harun Rashid, that there's a tradition that says that the women of the Ahlul Bayt, they only had one cloth amongst a number of people. Fundamentally, the reason was this, because he was worried, how is it possible the Imam has so much wealth? Harun Rashid was giving, but whenever somebody went to the Imam, the Imam gave more. So he said, it's perhaps through the women that these network of Khums and Zakat is there, strip them, search them. In the time of the sixth Imam, they say, in fact, in the time of the eighth Imam, we're very close to that happening, which didn't even happen in Karbala. Hukum was given, search these women. And at that stage, the Imam then says, if you do that, then we'll fight. Got that close to it. But the Imam protected, and it's his responsibility to protect his women. But look, Marif is important. Firstly, education. Educate yourself. Every Shia, whether you're living in the West or you're living in the East, it is your responsibility to educate yourself. Educate. Education for all of us. Male, female. Our ulama have said, as high as you can go. As high as you can go. Go to university. Have your, take your master's. Grab a PhD. However high you can go, do it. 
if you have the responsibility or if you have the opportunity, if your parents are taking care of you, go and study. Learn a skill. If university is not for you, learn a skill. Allah Tabatabai would say. People asked him, what do you do? He used to read. So they said, don't you get bored? He says, when I do, I read something else. Ilm is not something you can get bored with. This is what Amir al muminin says. Two types of people's thirst will never quench. One who goes after money, the more they accumulate, the more thirsty they become. And second, the people who go after ilm, the more they gain, the more thirsty they become. Very famously though, Allama Tabatabai on the day of Ashura, first year when he was in Najaf, studied on the day of Ashura, went blind. Goes to Sayyid al Shuhada says, From today onwards, I won't study on Ashura day. His eyesight came back. Remember, when the day of Ashura comes, do not work. Do not study. Do not do anything because that day is specifically and only for Sayyid al Shuhada. Even if your business is collapsing, your education is collapsing, the world is collapsing, just remember one thing Hussein ibn Ali. Nobody else. So this is important. Take it to the second stage. What else was the responsibility of the Imam? The second responsibility of the Imam was this. To teach people Ma'rifa. In this day and age, how do we do this? This is how we do it. Look, first thing is this. Hadith Kisa. Why is Hadith Kisa important? Hadith Kisa, in and of itself, was brought down and given nisbah to Zahra. Anything that's given nisbah to Zahra, it's the fastest methodology of acceptance. As I've said before, when Ayatollah Tabarezi's 40th came and ulama were discussing whether the Sanad is weak or not, Ayatollah Bahjad walked in and said, read Hadith Kisa. Ayatollah Bahuddinia said, from the four things, another that you should do when you're falling into a problem, one of them is to recite Hadith Kisa. Second is what? Second is Tawassul. Take the wassal of Ahlul Bayt. What type of the wassal? I'm going to go through a story. That story is this. Some of you privately may have heard it from me. But because others haven't heard it outside, I'm going to mention this. Story is this. Muqaddas Erdabili. Who is Muqaddas Erdabili? That person who Imam is Zaman called Muqaddas. Why is he so? Because he took care of the small things. Going to Hajj, horse is there, letter is given. He gets off his horse and he begins to walk. Why? Because he remembers, I only paid for this much and here somebody's giving me something extra, so I'm going to walk. That is a person who takes care of the small things, takes care of Sharia. What else do you find about Muqaddas al-Dabuli? And as you know, why is he Muqaddas? As he's going to Kufa, there's a horse rider who's coming. And as that horse rider comes forward, he says, where are you going? He says, I'm going to Kufa. He says, get on my horse. Gets on his horse. Sheikh Ahmed, do you know so-and-so from Ardabil? After Sheikh Ahmed told him, I'm from Ardabil. He says, yes, I know him. He's a great man. What about so-and-so? great man what about so and so great person and eventually the horse rider comes and he says do you know Sheikh Ahmed the one who they call Muqaddas al-Dabili here Sheikh Ahmed replies he says that they exaggerate he's actually not Muqaddas as you may think he is so the person smiles he says Sheikh Ahmed if Muqaddas al-Dabili wasn't Muqaddas al-Dabili he wouldn't be on the horse of the 12th Imam The people like that. Now, without going any deeper into this, how does Sheikh Ahmed Muqaddas Ardabili become Muqaddas Ardabili? He says one thing. Tawassal of Khaja Nasir al-Din al-Dusi. There is a tawassal that you recite on Tuesday, but there is one which is slightly more lengthier. Muqaddas Ardabili says, I got to this maqam. That maqam that Ayatollah Hassan Ilahi says that there are two people who I don't have access to in alam arwah after gaining the ability to go into and access alam arwah Hassan Ilahi, the brother of Allah Two people. 
He says one of them is Muqaddas Ardabili. Why? Because he's Jawar Amir al Mu'mineen. It's close to Amir al Mu'mineen. He's up there with Amir al Mu'mineen. Mokils don't allow me. That Muqaddas Ardabili says that the maqam that I reached was because of this tawassal. Why? Because the tawassal increases ma'rifah. And as you know, if you recite this tawassal a number of times, it's for hajj as well. And I'm not going to go into it. But every family at least, in a time where ma'rifah is decreasing, in a time where wilayah is decreasing, people don't talk about wilayah anymore. These 10 days about the fawail and the masaib of Ahlul Bayt, how many people today are talking about the fawail and masaib of Ahlul Bayt? Why aren't we talking about these things? Why aren't we increasing our ma'rifah? We can have workshops for everything else. This is about connection. But one of the reasons is this. When wilaya becomes weaker, then tawassal is the only way to strengthen that wilaya. So what do you do? Tawassalu khajan asir din And in this way, those things which are nisba to ahlul bayt. So second thing is ma'rifah. What is the third thing? Now remember this. Third thing is a dhikrullah. Remember dhikrullah as much as you can. What is the best dhikr that has no awarid, that has no side effects? The, every dhikr, remember, every name of Allah has a side effect as well. For example, you say ghani, ya ghani, ya ghani, you want to get rich. Remember, ghani is a person who is completely independent of everything else. If you don't know the proportion to recite it, you'll find people will start leaving you. Because you'll want to be independent. Tomorrow, if your children or wife leave you, then think what you're doing. But this is why for all afkar, it has to be within a controlled environment. Somebody has to give it to you with ijazah. Why? Because the spiritual master is also in charge of removing the hurdles that come in as well. This is why they say, go to the Kamilin. This is why when Ayatollah Kashmiri was asked, this is why when others were asked, even though Ayatollah Kashmiri himself was Kamilin, part of the Kamilin, but he was asked, who's the best teacher of Irfan? He says, living at the moment, Ayatollah Bahjad. When he was asked, who were the top students? Now remember, Sayyid Ali Qadi's students were who? Allama Tabatabai, Hassan Allahi, Ali Muhammad Burujardi, Abbas Kashani, Ayatollah Bahjad etc 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 so he was asked even Ayatollah Khoui for a short period of time was a student of Sadali Qadi Marhum so the question was asked who are the best students of Ayatollah, Ayatollah Qadi Ayatollah Kashmir said three people it says Ali Muhammad Ibn Jardi Bahjad and the third one who they called Qadi Athani was who? Said Ahmad Kashmiri if you go to Siri Nagar today, he's buried there. Stories say that he had the ability, Mot Ikhtiari, whenever he wanted, his soul would go into Malakut. He was the second Qadi. And after Najaf, he went back to Siri Nagar where he resided, where he's buried. Another student of Qadi said Hassan Masqati is also buried in India. He's buried in Hyderabad. So in this way, you found. These are the students, Kamilin, and within this line, Kamilin, their job was really to help people on this pathway. Now you can ask me a question. Well, today, there's nobody around. What do we do? After Ayatollah Bahjad, all of those students from the line of Qadi have disappeared. Yes, maybe there was somebody in Najaf. Sheikh Abd, he's passed away now. And there's a second as well, which people most probably don't know about nor am I going to mention his name until they don't declare it themselves but the fact of the matter is this people can say well people like that are not around anymore you don't need people like that to come in front of your face you have to build yourself so that the 12th Imam sends people to you you have to build yourself up some people will say well we're at a disadvantage in time of Najaf they were XYZ okay they were they say ulama of Najaf in the olden days had three abilities. One ability they had, al majafr One ability they had, Day al ard One ability they had, they could read the mir, the urafa. So well, we don't have that anymore. Well, there's a reason why. As materialism increases, spirituality decreases. 
If you work on yourself, everything will open up. Remember one thing, you are not separated from your Imam. You are not separated from Sayyidul Shuhada. Let me give you a tradition. One day, fifth Imam says, my father and I were walking. We were walking outside of Medina. I saw that an old man came forward. My father, with all of respect, went running. And he said, may my mother and father be sacrificed to you. Kissed him on the hand, respected him. Afterwards, when I asked my father who that was, he said that that was my father, Hussein ibn Ali. Sayyidul Shuhada, you physically can't see him. That doesn't mean that he's divided from you. Remember the Shuhada are not dead. Allah has given them risk. You can't see them. It's a very thin line. Where do they reside? Malakut. Develop your own Malakut. Alam and Malakut. Open your eyes and you'll see it. You'll see what you need to see. It. Have you not? This book that's been translated that everybody has in their house now, Elixir of Love about Rajab Ali Khayat. Rajab Ali Khayat himself was a Khayat. He wasn't even an Alim. But in that book, when he says Salam, the Imams came in front of him. Was it an alim? Just a normal person. But you can build yourself up to that level. What does it require though? It requires focus. Dhikrullah. If you were to ask me what the best dhikr is, the best dhikr without any awarith is salawat. Just remember that the world is watching. Let it not be that they say that our two elders in Edinburgh can't give a salawat. Allah. Oh, mashallah. Not only the elders, but the youngsters in Edinburgh can also. And this is that Edinburgh, that Imam Hussein Day, nowhere in the world has been established but Scotland officially. That nowhere else in the world has that iftikhar but Scotland does. That Imam Hussein Day officially has been established in Scotland. So no. And this is the power of Salawat. And we've got to continue to do it. Remember, you know what you're doing? With Salawat, you're removing hurdles. You're removing hurdles. In your... What are you doing? You're saying to Rasulullah, you're giving him Salawat and Salam. You pray for Rasulullah, you think he's not going to come and pray for you? He's not going to come and pray for your family? Focus on what you're saying. This is why they say people, some people say Bismillah, and others say Bismillah and they walk over water. For example, why? Ma'rif of what you're saying. Bismillah in and of itself contains isma adam. Second dhikr, remember this always. Sajda Yunasiya. Sajda Yunasiya is very powerful. Recite Sajda Yunasiya. Why? What is it? La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inni kum sumanahu alameen. Go into Sajda. If you ever get an opportunity, five times, ten times, twenty times, fifty times. Recite it a couple of times. Why is that important? They say that if you want your hijab to open from your eyes, they go to Yunasiya for forty days. You recite it a particular amount of times, you'll see your hijab opens. Hujab begin to open. Haqiqa begins to reflect inside of you. Akhlaq begins to become kamil. Final thing is this though. There's one more thing the Imam taught us. You know what that is? Service to other people. Today Shias must be recognized for their service, for their kindness. For their kindness. For their giving. And we have to give unconditionally without wanting anything back. And that's what will make the difference. That when we give unconditionally, without wanting anything back. So look, we can develop this discussion forward. There's something I wanted to mention to you. But looking at the time, we don't have the time to discuss it. Remember these jewels. Everything is there for you. Ilm. Study hard. Ma'rifa, tawassul of the Ahlul Bayt. Especially introduce into your house. Once a month, I'm saying. Okay, not even once a week, once a month. 
12 months of the year for every Imam do Tawassal of Khaja Nasir al-Din al-Tusi. You'll see balas removed from your life, afata removed from your life. Peace comes into your heart. And then dhikr, recite salawats, recite istighfar. Don't you remember when one of our brothers was unable to get married? What did Allah Bahjid say to him? Very simple. Recite salawat and do istighfar. When you've recited enough and you feel like changing, do istighfar. Within a week, a proposal came for him. Happily married now. Istighfar and salawat. Both of these are amazing. Why? Istighfar, you are repenting and then you're going back to Allah. What does that do? Removes hurdles, trials, tribulations. Because remember one thing. What is the purpose of your life? You are traveling back to Allah. By traveling, you have to go from different maqamat stations. Manazil. You have to go from one level to another level to another. And inshallah, maybe tomorrow we'll look at it. There are a hundred, according to at least Manazil as sairin that some of the Orafa study, which is probably the most comprehensive book on the different stages. He says that there are a hundred. Though he said I was taught a thousand, but he's compiled it to a hundred. And he says each one of these has a beginner, intermediary, and advanced level. That how you go through these different stages, Manazil. We'll look at it tomorrow. I want to go into much deeper into the philosophy of these Manazils. That when is the stage of Fatuwa? When is the stage when Mukashifat comes? When is the stage when you go through perfection? Inshallah, we'll go through that tomorrow. Look, today, we have a huge responsibility. If Zahra salam gives us permission, I want you for just one second. Close your eyes. Go to Medina. In the darkness of the night, with his quietness, walk towards Baqi. Look at the darkness of Baqi. A mother rests in Baqi. You're going to give condolences to that mother today. Who is that mother? That mother is that person who, when a voice came to Medina, she says to Fadl, Fadl, get me my stick. Stick comes, she goes into the Sahan, looks towards Najaf and says, My master Amir al Mu'minin. Forgive me that my son Abbas was unable to protect your son Hussein. Look, you have great aqidah on Abbas. Whenever you go through trial and tribulation, your mothers have said to you, go on the flag of Abbas. As I begin to recite this, I'm going to recite slowly. I myself can't take the Masai of Abbas. There shouldn't be an eye today that's not crying. Haq of Abbas is that you cry for him. Look, today we can't be together. We're sitting scattered all over the world. Today, remember one thing. Abbas is Babul Hawaj. What do you give? You get back in the way of Ahlul Bayt. If I had the opportunity, I would recite a very long Masai to tell you what Abbas is. But because of the situation, I won't be able to. I want to give you a story. 
سيد مهدي بحر العلوم از ذا مرجا It was raining so much in Karbala that they say the shrine of Abbas was damaged. One of the khuddam of the shrine come to Sayyid Mahdi Bahlulum in Najaf. They say, Sayyid Mahdi, water has gone into the shrine of Abbas. Can you come and help us to remove the water from around the Qabr of Abbas? Sayyid Mahdi, Marja of the time, says yes. He goes, both of them sit there, removing slowly, slowly the water. So the Khadim looks up and something comes into the heart of the Khadim. He says to Sayyid Mahdi Bahrulun, he says, Sayyid, you've told us that Abbas was so tall. Why is it that this grave is so small? Sayyid Mahdi takes off his amama, chucks it on the ground. hits his head on the wall of the grave. He says, I wish you never asked me that question. He says, but now that you've asked me, let me tell you why his grave is so small. He says, when Abbas fell and they cut his neck, they said that horses were trampling over his body and men were coming. Whatever they had in their hand, they were hitting his body so much so that when Imam Zain al-Abideen came to bury him, when he picked up his rib, the other rib collapsed. When he picked up his shoulder, the other shoulder collapsed. He took all of the pieces of Abbas. This is why his grave is small. <laughs> And my father, my father, Zahra, accept your tears. Look, I know you won't be able to take the Messiah of Abbas. This is what I'm going to recite slowly. Remember, when tears come into your eyes, dua is accepted. In Iraq, they say there are three Babul Hawaijas. Imam Musa ibn Ja'far is one. Sayyid Muhammad in Balad is two. But the biggest door for the du'as to be answered is Abul Fadl Abbas. You're sitting today next to Abul Fadl Abbas. Why? Because when we start the musibah of Abbas, your soul travels towards Karbala. Now imagine if you're walking through Bain al Haramain and you're coming towards the Zari of Abbas. And when you come to the Zari of Abbas and you look at it for the first time, what does Sayyid al Shuhada say? Sayyid al Shuhada says to Abul Fadl Abbas, These are my guests. For three days, you're the guest of Hussein. They say when the news came that Abbas had been killed, Ummul Banin comes out. She says, Bashir, she wanted to verify. Bashir, which Hussein is it that you talk about? Says the son of Zahra. Says, how is it possible that the son of Zahra has been killed? My Abbas was with him. How is it possible? Says, Bibi, your son Abbas was also killed. She says, how is it possible that my son Abbas was killed? Said he was hit on the back of the head. She says, Bashir, I don't believe you. Says, why? Says, no mother has born a son like Abbas, like I have. I know Abbas. There's no way somebody can attack Abbas from the back. She says, but your son had no arms. His arms were chopped off. They say, Ummul Benin looks up. Stick falls out of the hand, falls to the ground, stands up again, says Bashir, just tell me one thing, when my son Abbas fell to the ground, he didn't have any arms, did his chest hit the ground first, or did his head hit the ground first? <laughs> If you ever go to Medina and you go to the grave of Ummul Banin, ask Ummul Banin, Ummul Banin, your son fell once. Say the Zainab's arms were tied behind her back. Every time she fell, did her chest hit the ground first or did her head hit the ground first? You know, they say the huck of crying is when your voice is raised. This is when the sixth Imam says that may the Rahmah of Allah befall all of those voices that cry. 
for the sake of my chat. Let me start off from here. Look, I haven't even started to recite the Messiah of Abbas yet. So let me recite this. Amir al Mu'minin. I'm going to go slowly as I said. Look, you ask for Hajat. You ask for Hajat. Inshallah, for the sake of Bab al Hawaj, all of your Hajat will be fulfilled. They say Amir al Mu'minin was looking for a wife. He says to his brother Aqil, find me a particular wife. You know the story. I'm going to accelerate. Aqil finds a woman. Aqil finds an honorable family. He goes to the father of that family. As he goes, he says that we want your daughter. So at that moment, the man replies. He says, for who? He replies, for my brother, Ali. The head of the tribe can't believe it. He says, yes, for me. So what happens then? Aqil replies. He says, listen, we're Banu Hashim. You ask the daughter first. We don't say yes until the daughter doesn't say yes. This man gets up and he runs to his wife. When his wife sees him, she knows the head of the tribes never show any emotions. She says, what day has come where you're showing this type of emotion? He replies, he says, he says that Ali ibn Abi Talib's brother has come to ask for our daughter's hand in marriage. Did you say yes? He said, I said yes, but they said Banu Hashim don't accept until the woman that itself says yes. You know what happens? They go, they go and ask one of the friends, say, go ask Fatima. Her name was Fatima. Ask Fatima if she accepts this proposal. As one of the friends went in and they asked Fatima, what happens? What happens? Fatima turns around and says, she says, last night I saw a dream. In my dream, I saw there was a marriage dress there. And when I looked at the marriage dress, I saw a woman dressed in black come towards me. Who was she? She said, I'm Fatima to Zahra. She puts the dress on me. She says, tomorrow when the proposal comes for my Ali, you accept that proposal because from your progeny is going to come Abbas and that Abbas is going to help my Hussein. <laughs> Look how Zahra is. Even after her death, even after her death, she's taking care of Amir al -Mu'minin. Fatima says, yes, this Ummul Banin then says yes. Tradition says, swords of Banu Hashim are there. Ummul Banin goes underneath the swords. She comes in Medina to the house of Zahra. She sits down on the floor. She says, how can I go into that house that Zahra was in this house? They say, Zainab comes forward. Umm Kulthum comes forward, grabs them by the arms, takes Ummul Banin into the house. They say when Amir al muminin came into the house, he called Ummul Banin by the name Fatima. When Fatima looked at the tears in the eyes of the children, of Zahra, she says, Amir al Mu'minin, from today onwards, don't call me Fatima here. Fatima is Fatima, there's only one Fatima, and from today, call me Ummul Banin. Amir al Mu'minin prays. Who does he pray for? A son Abbas. Abbas comes into the world. Amir al Mu'minin, Amir al Mu'minin had this tradition. Whenever a child would be born, he would go and kiss the forehead. They say when he comes into the room where Ummul Banin had delivered, Abbas was wrapped in a white sheet. He opens it up. He smiles. He begins to kiss Abbas on the right arm and Abbas on the left arm. Ummul Banin's tears come in her eyes. She says, Amir al Mu'minin, I've seen your kiss. All of your children on the forehead is it because Abbas is the son of a slave that you kiss him on the right arm and you kiss him on the left arm Amir al muminin says Ummul Balin that's not the case Abbas is my son but Abbas is going to go to Karbala his right arm is going to be cut his <laughs> Abbas begins to grow like I can't narrate it she of Amir al Mu'minin, only if we were together to mourn together. Battle of Safin comes. You know the proudest moment where a father is? When he sees the bravery of his son. 
They say there was no prouder moment for this old father. Amir al muminin would say, look at my Abbas fight in the battle of Safin. Amir al muminin with pride. And what was Abbas saying to Malik al -Ashtar? Today you'll see Dhulfiqar Ali, the inheritor of this Dhulfiqar. Look and see how I fight. Look, I can't recite anymore. You won't be able to hear it. I just want to say two things and that's it. Night of Muharram comes. And they say Sayyid al Shuhada sends two people. One of them is Zuhair. Go ask from the army of Umar ibn Sa'd. We want one more night. Abbas is with them. These two old men, as they begin to write, one says to the other, Do you remember the day when Amir al Mu'minin got married? He says, I'm going to have a son like Abbas. Abbas is going to protect Hussein. As Abbas begins to listen, he can't take it anymore. He puts his hand on the reins of his horse and holds it back. He says, don't say any more now. Just get me permission from my master. And until tomorrow, you'll see that I'll attack this army and I'll finish this army. Ashura day comes. One person goes. His body comes back. Two people go. His body comes back. Three people go, his body comes back. Banu Hashim begin to go. The body of Ali Akbar comes back. Abbas is looking at Imam Hussein's face. Qasim comes back. On and Muhammad come back. Eventually a time comes. Abu Fadl Abbas is Mola. Can I now go in? The reply comes. But you are my standard bearer. He says, Mola, what army is left now? Let me go now. Imam Hussein doesn't give him ijaza. As Abbas is walking, he comes and he sees in a tent, a small girl is there. She picks up a container of water, she shakes it as empty, she puts the coldness on her lips, she puts the coldness on her face. Abbas sees his moment, comes forward, Sakina, would you like some water? Do you want me to get you some water? She says, yes, uncle. He says, just on one condition, go and ask your father to give me permission to go. Sakina goes running, smiling. She says, Father, please give Ijaza to my Ammu Abbas to go and to get us some water. Imam Hussein looks up. He says, Sakina, do you know what you're asking for? Sakina comes back. She says, oh, young girls, oh, children of Banu Hashim, oh, children of Ashab Hussein, let's get together. Get all of your containers of water. No water is coming. My Abbas is going into the battlefield. Look, if I could recite any more, I would do. You know what the tradition says? I can't recite. I'm just going to give you two things. My heart can't take it. I'm going to recite slowly. Your naseeb now. Tears come into your eyes. Your dua is accepted. Your naseeb now. This small girl sits down. Have you ever seen a masum, small masum, a small girl? She sits down with all of her faith. You know, children have a lot of faith. They're so pure. When you see a child, you can look at the purity of that child. This girl turns around and says, water is coming. But when she looks into the distance and she sees the flag fall to the right hand side, she takes her flask, she chucks it on the ground, she raises her hands. She says, children, I'm going to do dua. You say amin. She raises her hands, says, Allah, make sure my uncle comes back. I wish I could not I'm not able to recite. I'll just say one thing. They say when Abbas fell to the ground, in the tradition it says just before he fell to the ground, he had a water container in his mouth. When they chopped his right arm, he put it on his left arm. When they chopped his left arm, he put it in his mouth. They say when Mal'oon comes forward, when Mukhtar grabs Hurmala, he says, Hurmala, what did you do on that day? Hurmala says, I fired three arrows. Says, what was the first arrow? He says, when Hussein was on the horse, moving from right 
right to left and everybody had been killed, I fired an arrow that went through the mouth of Hussein, that Hussein fell to the ground. Second thing I did was fired an arrow that Ali Asghar's. Third, I fired an arrow onto the water of Abbas. Abbas raised his head. Have you seen a person pray? They raised their hands. Abbas had no hands to raise. He raises his head to the sky. He says, Allah, I just have one dua. Make sure this water gets back to Sakina because Sakina is thirsty. A voice comes from the sky. Abbas, we've not accepted your dua, but we've made you mustajab or dawa. From today onwards, your babul hawaij. Whoever asks for me, you can give. So he says, Allah then, accept my second dua. I feel embarrassed from Sakina. Make sure my body never goes back. <laughs> they say when Abbas gives his final salam to Sayyid al-Shuhada. They say Sayyid al-Shuhada held his back. <laughs> Sayyid al-Shuhada falls to the ground. Sayyid al-Shuhada can't walk. When he comes to the body of Abbas, there was blood in Abbas's eyes. Abbas couldn't see. You know what he says? He says, oh person, don't kill me yet. My Mullah Hussein is coming. Mola Hussein says, Abbas, I'm your brother. You know what Mullah Abbas says? He says, Mullah, I wouldn't have given you the Zahma, but there's blood in my eyes. My mother said, when I was born, I did your ziyara. Now that I'm leaving, I want to do your ziyara. Can you clean the blood? Mullah Hussein takes his Abba, rubs the blood from the eyes of Abbas. You know why Abbas had blood in his eyes? Final thing I'm going to say. I can't take it now. I can't recite anymore. In Karbala, for all of those people who are from Iraq, you'll know this. There was a marja by the name of Ayatollah Yahya Yathrabi. Yahya Yathrabi goes to the shrine of Abbas. A wise was reciting. You know what he was reciting? He was reciting this. An arrow went into the eye of Abbas. They say Yahya Yathrubi can't take it anymore. He says to the person when he came down, he says, oh wise, don't ever recite that. Firstly, I'm an old man. But secondly, I don't know if the hadith is correct or not. That night, Ayatollah Yahya Yathrubi says, when I went to sleep, I saw Abu al-Fadl Abbas come into my dream. Abbas just said one thing to me. Why did you stop my wise from reciting? <laughs> Yahya Yathrabi says, maybe the hadith was weak. Abu al-Fadl Abbas says, no, the hadith is strong. Arrow did go into my eye. He says, Yahya Yathrabi, do you know how painful it is when something goes into your eye? He says, it was hurting me so much. When something goes into somebody's eyes, they have hands to pull out. He says, I didn't have any arms. I was moving my body left and right to try and remove the arrow as the pain increased. I wanted to call my Mola Hussein, but I knew he was gharib. He was alone. I knew Sayyidah Zainab was there as I'm moving my head side to side. I don't have the ability to move the arrow out. So I put my head between my knees to try and take out the arrow. But as I tried to dislodge it, the pain began to increase and increase and increase. And it was hurting me. I didn't know what to do. I couldn't call Hussein. I looked towards Najaf and I said, Father, come and help me because Abbas is... <laughs>